Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. Confusion, concern, and calls for accountability. Nearly two months since the shootings at Robb Elementary, two officers are on leave. And even after a new report and video, there are still questions that need to be answered. I'll start with one. Why was there so much confusion on the day of the shooting in Uvalde? In newly released body camera video, you can hear one officer urge other officers to get to the classroom before he's told that DPS is sending its own officers. Dude, we gotta get in there. Yeah. DPS is sending the people. We gotta get in there. He's keep shooting. We gotta get in there. Now, more than 300 officers responded to the scene in Uvalde. That includes local, state, and federal law enforcement. But it took more than an hour before law enforcement went into the classroom and killed the gunman. We know that 19 children and two teachers died. Right now, only two officers are on leave. Uvalde's acting police chief, Lieutenant Mariano Pagas, and an internal review underway for that department and its response. Uvalde School District Police Chief Pete Arredondo also on leave tonight. DPS putting blame on him, calling him the incident commander on scene. And today, DPS announced they will be conducting an internal investigation on their own response. Border Patrol says a similar review is underway for that agency. This added to tonight's heated school board meeting in Uvalde tonight. Families and community members speaking for hours, demanding something that's been elusive so far, accountability. The night team's Lee Waldman joins us now live. And Lee, you also just learned something about the school district police chief, right? We did. We learned tonight that Pete Arredondo's administrative leave is in fact page, paid rather, and much of the outrage that happened at this school board meeting was because Arredondo is still being employed by the school district. In hindsight, this meeting should have happened earlier. I apologize that it did not. Trying to find the right time, the right balance out of respect, I did not do well. An apology from Uvalde Superintendent Dr. Hal Harrell falling on deaf ears. If he's not fired by noon tomorrow, then I want your resignation and every single one of you board members because y'all do not give a damn about our children or us. Families stating their kids will not continue their education here until actions are taken. Most of those kids were my friends. And that's not good. And I don't want to go to your guys' school if they don't have protection. Dr. Harrell explained he cannot be fired until it is decided on by the school board. Y'all hire him, y'all can fire him. Those same messages were repeated over and over again by much of the by many of the speakers that we heard tonight. We also learned tonight that the first day of school is going to be delayed until after Labor Day in order to have much of those safety precautions put into place. Now, Harold mentioned that an eight foot perimeter fence will be put up around the elementary school as well as the middle school. Now, we're currently on the high school campus. He said that's not the plan for this campus. They're still working on what to do here. Live in Uvalde, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Lee, stay with me for a second. I want to ask you a question. Is it my understanding tonight that the school board and the superintendent took no action in actually firing Chief Pete Arredondo? Is that correct? That's exactly right. And they said the reason for that is because they, one, still need to review the investigation report that was handed out by the House Committee yesterday. They said that also has to be done in a special meeting, a closed door meeting with the school board, even though there were countless parents who begged for action to be taken. No action was taken tonight. I wanted to clarify that. Lee Waldman live in Uvalde. Thank you, Lee. Chief Peter Arredondo still on paid administrative leave tonight. Now, there's still information that lawmakers want to learn about in this response at Robb Elementary. State Senator Roland Gutierrez wants to know where state troopers were situated and who gave them orders during that response at Robb Elementary. He says the report from a House committee and released video is simply not enough. He plans to ask for more details during a court hearing scheduled for August 4th. We see a, a Texas Ranger walking around for 20 minutes. He's followed by a game warden. He's the guy with the, the tablet that's the schematic of the school. Both of those guys are talking to somebody. I need to know who they were talking to, who was calling the shots over there for the Department of Public Safety, and why it is they just didn't do anything either. The DPS undergoing an internal review, but they have not said when it would be complete. They say the actions of every state police agent and Texas Ranger will be examined to determine if anyone 
violated policies or laws. In the meantime, Governor Greg Abbott also responding to the Texas House findings. He says he's going to start working with the legislature to develop, quote, necessary changes to improve public safety, school safety, and mental health assessment and treatment, end quote. Now, some people still want a special session to pass gun reform. The State Teachers Association wants a law that raises the age requirement from 18 to 21 to buy assault-style weapons. It asks, quote, what business does a teenager who's not in military service have with an assault rifle, end quote. Just last week, some families traveled from Uvalde to Washington, D.C. to demand an increase in the age requirement for assault-style weapons. State Senator Roland Gutierrez has also voiced similar calls for action. So many of you have been talking about this online. You may be struggling to speak with your kids about exactly what happened. Metro Health wants to help you with that. It's offering free seminars to help guide you. The first one is tomorrow from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. And then there's a second seminar. This one's in Spanish. That one's on Wednesday. We have all the details for you on KSAT.com. The cases of monkeypox continue to spread in our community tonight. Metro Health confirmed five cases of the illness in Bear County. They say the risk remains low, though. This is an illness that does not discriminate, but you can protect yourself by avoiding skin to skin contact in crowded areas. The illness is rarely fatal, but is known to give the person rashes and sores. Metro Health is keeping track of the tally of, of cases on its website. We have a link to that site right now on KSAT.com. And doctors also encouraging you to wear a mask in crowded areas tonight. Metro Health says the risk for COVID-19 remains high. 877 new cases confirmed today. No new deaths. Tonight, 332 COVID-19 patients remain hospitalized. And here at home, was it a murder or a freak accident? That's what a jury is going to try to decide in the trial against David Estrada. Investigators say he killed his wife after running her over with his truck back in 2020. An officer who responded to the scene today took the stand. Officer Steve Ramos also shared body cam footage showing Estrada was hovering over his wife's body, claiming she was hit by someone else's truck when she was walking alone. I asked him, um, how did you know that she had got hit? And he says he hears a loud bang. And I said, well, okay, well, what, what occurred prior to the argument that, that led up to the argument? And he just kept saying the words of, well, you know what happens. You know what happens. The prosecutors say Estrada's truck was damaged and had blood on it. Estrada's attorney says it was all a freak accident. They're expected to present their case later this week. Now for a look at your headlines in your Nightbeat News Flash. He rose through the ranks despite failing a state drug screening. And now years later and after mounting complaints, Medina Valley ISD is without an athletic director and head football coach. Lee Crisp resigned on Friday. Now parents complain that Crisp appeared intoxicated at several school events, refused to allow a football player to ride home with the team, and even mocked a student's lisp. His resignation comes after the district reopened an investigation. Social media and a tattoo gun. Bear County deputies say that this man right here used both of them to assault his 15-year-old victim. Investigators say that 19-year-old J. Robert Rodriguez used Instagram and Snapchat to lure the teen. According to an affidavit, the girl was forced to have sex with him. Deputies say that he also tattooed the name J on the teenager's upper arm. Right now, Rodriguez faces a charge of online solicitation of a minor. All of it caught on camera. Dilly police shared video of officers using spike strips in a chase with suspected human smugglers. Now, Dilly police say that it happened this morning. The spike deployment flattened the suspect's tires, slowing them down before the suspect eventually hit an 18-wheeler. Seven suspected migrants in the vehicle were injured. A little later on in the day, Dilly police stopped another pursuit, and officers ended that one before any accidents or injuries. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. Still ahead tonight on the night beat, we've been on bloom watch for days, but the San Antonio Zoo says that La Llorona may be leaving us in tears. Hmm. That update coming up. How you doing, guys? Thanks for showing up. He was a strategist for former President Donald Trump. Now Steve Bannon is facing trial. The case against him coming up.
And five people killed in an apartment fire nearly four years later, a new reward in the arson case. But that's not all. How a local filmmaker is also shedding light on this case. It's next on The Night Beat. Still no arrests. Four years since a deadly apartment fire in San Marcos. There's new reward money being offered. The victim's families are hoping that it's going to bring in new leads. The night team's Patty Santos spoke with, a, spoke, spoke with a filmmaker about his efforts to honor everyone who was hurt by this tragedy. July 20th, 2018, a massive fire breaks out at the iconic Village Apartments, killing five and injuring several others. Investigators say it was arson. It's not close to being solved to the best of my knowledge. Brian Frizzle's sister was killed and his best friend nearly died. His struggles with not only his physical capabilities, uh, but also mental capabilities now. The filmmaker is working on a documentary about the victims and those who survived that massive nightmare. It was always about getting justice, having someone see it, hopefully someone who knows something, and uh, them coming forward to to uh, help us out. And over time, you know, it became a little bit about giving other people space to talk about their feelings and uh, have it be out there. The city of San Marcos, the ATF and private donors are offering a $110,000 reward for tips that could lead to an arrest. Hopefully they'll lead to getting some resolution in this case. And just this month, Hayes County Crime Stoppers announced a new $1,000 reward. And we've started receiving some tips and they've been forwarded off to investigators. The documentary called The Weight of Ashes has taken an emotional toll on Frizzle. He hopes it has the same effect on whoever knows who's responsible for the fire, but has kept quiet. It'll bring a lot of peace to people. It's, it's, it's a monstrous thing to do to keep this information to yourself. Yeah, and anyone with information on this fire is urged to call the ATF at number 888-283-8477. And Frizzle tells us his film is about 73 minutes long. He hopes that he can finish it in the next year or so. And he says any funds, any money that he makes from this documentary will go right back towards combining it with the reward money that's already out there. Steve Stefania. Hope they get some answers. Thank you, Patty. Want to get some breaking news right now. A crash investigation taking place at 281 and Hildebrand. Yeah, you see the backup right there. The southbound lanes of 281. That's what seems to be impacted right now. As you can see, traffic there slowing down to a crawl. This is right by the University of the Incarnate Word. So we don't know how far back this stretches uh, the closure, but just keep in mind that you should take an alternate route if you're on 281. And again, the southbound lanes impacted near 281 and Hildebrand. It actually looks like both sides of 281 right now are impacted. I'm not seeing anybody moving in the northbound lanes either. So we're going to continue to watch this again. A crash at 281 and Hildebrand. Meanwhile, jury selection underway for the criminal trial of former Trump strategist Steve Bannon. He faces contempt charges for refusing to comply with the congressional subpoena. The January 6th committee believes Bannon had, quote, specific knowledge about the events planned before the Capitol riot. It's nothing but a show trial. It's time they start having other witnesses. They can give other, si other testimony other than what they've been putting up. The Bannon previously said he was protected under executive privilege then later said he would testify. The January 6th committee says it will not consider his offer until he actually hands over requested documents. Now to a night beat update. Yes, my friends, the San Antonio Zoo has confirmed that that flower, the corpse flower, which was nicknamed La Llorona, is not going to bloom after all. It released a picture showing part of the flowers. You can see right there starting to wilt. The zoo is still planning to keep La Llorona on display for the next few days because they want you to learn about the life cycle of the plant and continue to try and save the corpse flower from extin extinction. That plant is going to have another chance to bloom in about six to ten years, and that's why it's such a big deal. It only blooms every six to ten years. Yep. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if the weather 
had anything, had anything to do with, to do with it because yeah. it's been so hot. I, I don't blame it for not yeah, wanting it's to not move. The, it's not the only thing wilting in this. It <laughs> just gave up. You know, it's hard even at home. My uh, flower beds and stuff, just you know, hand watering them every day, or they. They just wilt completely over. You got to stay on top of it. And the heat, of course, it's it's here to stay. We've got the triple digits that are going to continue. Not as much African dust today. There was a haze in the air and still some African dust, but a lot lighter than what we had yesterday. And then tomorrow, you're not even going to notice it at all. Sunny and dry for forecast, unfortunately. Triple digit heat, it continues. Take a look at this. High temperatures tomorrow, 103. Then Wednesday and Thursday, we should have record high temperatures. Wednesday making it to 104 and Thursday about 103. So let's talk about this. Look at today. Our high temperature, we made it to 101. That's just three degrees shy of the record and six degrees above average for this time of year. So far this month in San Antonio, we've now had, or not this month, so far this year, okay, year to date, we've had 39 100 degree days. To put that in perspective, by Thursday, we should be ranked third all time for 100 degree days in a given year. And there's a lot of summer left. The most was 59 back in 2009. In 2009, I just looked it up, by this date in 2009, we had 27 100 degree days. So obviously we're on the fast track to be not just top three, but if this persists very easily, number one for most 100 degree days in a year as the summer comes to a close after August and even into September, we get 100 degree heat. 91 degrees, that's the current reading. Dew point is 67. Nice stout southeasterly wind at 20 miles per hour. So at least we have a breeze out there. You look at temperatures now, a lot of us dropping down into the 80s, but still some 90s. Hondo 92, Catula 93. Pleasanton 88, Kerrville right now at 85 degrees. Not all that bad, 89 in Helos and 86 in Seguin. The humidity is on the rise though. Dew points are on their way back up from the 50s earlier today, but they're climbing again at night and tomorrow's gonna be the same trend. We see the dew points fall off later on and in the afternoon during the hottest part of the day. Here's the big picture. You look across the state, quiet weather, we're looking for rain. Big Blue H, upper level heights, centered over the four corners. So if we could get a disturbance in this northerly flow aloft, we could get one to get steered our way, it could happen, but there's, there's nothing out there and there's not enough moisture to work with anyway. So we look to the tropics and you look at the tropics over the next at least five days, no development, not even one of those little 10 to 20% chances for development, not even a swirl out there that could get something stirred up. So tomorrow we start the day at 78. By the noon hour, we get up to 93 degrees, then a high temperature today of 103 at 4 and 5 p.m. And overall, we're going to be above 100 just about everywhere. Eagle Pass 106, 102 Stone Oak, Elmendorf, Lasoya about 105. And there's the sunshine in triple digits. It just continues for the foreseeable future. All right, thank you. Hot, hot, and more hot. Indeed, but you know, let's talk about basketball now. DeJounte Murray and the Spurs. Looks like there's no love lost there. Yeah, things are starting to heat up on social media between DeJounte fans and his explanation of maybe what's going ahead in the future. When we come back, DeJounte's calling out the Spurs on social media. We'll actually hear his response, in this case, see his response. And major league opportunities for young high school athletes who progressed to college and now have a shot at major league baseball coming up. Change in social media that indicates DeJounte Murray's relationship with the Spurs is strained in his eyes and could have been part of the reason why the All-Star guard was traded to the Atlanta Hawks. It started with a very cryptic tweet from DeJounte yesterday that has since been deleted that said, I feel free and wanted, only to be followed up with a response to a fan who wrote on DeJounte's Instagram farewell post, quote, bye, fly little birdie, good luck getting to the second round. At least we got the picks and building around Keldon. DeJounte's response, the way that system is set up, you're going to be losing for the next 15 years problem bigger than basketball. That is far from what DeJounte had to say on the day he was introduced as a Hawk, claiming the Spurs are just looking out for him as they begin the rebuilding process. Now perhaps another reason why the Spurs moved on.
Big day for a lot of former San Antonio area high school baseball athletes following their college careers because some of them are getting their shot at Major League Baseball thanks to the 2022 draft this week. As we told you first on instant replay last night, right out of the gate, Jace Young, a MacArthur High School grad and Texas Tech Red Raider, was picked up by the Detroit Tigers at number 12 in the first round. The Tigers be the first to tell you that they were surprised the left-handed slugger was around at number 12 because but when pitchers started being selected first, luck was on the Tigers' side. Jace is the younger brother to Josh Young. Three years ago, was the eighth overall pick for the Texas Rangers. And Jace told us in his first interview since joining the Tigers that one of his teachers at MacArthur predicted he was going to wind up being with the Tigers. Here's a little story. Um, when I was in high school, I had a teacher. His name was Mr. Philippone. Um, he was in, I was in 10th grade, I think. And he uh, told me every day I'd walk in his class that I was going to be a Detroit Tiger, get drafted by the Detroit Tigers in 10th grade. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, whatever, you know, just he'd say it to me every day, you know, he was a huge Detroit Tiger fan. And it was just, he was crazy. I've been, I called him right after the draft and, you know, he was screaming and everything. So, you know, it was just funny. It's just, it was awesome. All right, and besides Jace, here are some others that got drafted today, including Cole Phillips out of Bernie, Jalen Battles out of Madison High School going to the Tampa Bay Rays. And the rest of the draft picks look like this. Doug Hodo III out of Bernie, Baltimore Orioles, and Dalton Sheffield out of Johnson to the Twins. Clayton Kershaw will make his first Major League All-Star start tomorrow night in what will be a home game for the Dodgers Ace. The American League will go with Shane McClanahan after American League All-Star manager Dusty Baker said Shohei Otani's camp indicated he shouldn't or wouldn't start, but will be the first batter as DH. Dusty is representing presenting the Astros of the All-Star Game and given the animosity that Dodger fans have for Houston after their cheating scandal during the 2017 season that Dodger fans feel robbed Los Angeles of a World Series title, Dusty is hoping the L.A. crowd will hold off on booing the current Astros. I would prefer uh, that this beautiful town of L.A. don't and kind of forget the past because most of the players that are here uh, weren't even there during the, the scandal. And I just wonder... Uh, about the forgiveness of human, of mankind, and also at the same time, I hope that they don't, they don't boo him because it doesn't do any good. All right, preseason honors for UTSA quarterback Frank Harris next. Congratulations to UTSA Roadrunner star quarterback Frank Harris has been named to the Maxwell watch list, which was announced today. The senior from Church Clemens High School is one of 85 FBS players on the Maxwell Award watch list, which is presented to the outstanding player in college football. Harris enters this season with a 20 and 8 record as a starter, throwing for 5,293 yards, 42 touchdowns with a completion percentage of 66 percent, rush for an additional 1,220 yards and 15 touchdowns as a roadrunner. Last year guided UTSA to their most successful season in roadrunner football history with a 12 and 2 record and their first ever conference USA championship. And you can add Aggie running back Devon A. Chain to the Maxwell watch list as well. The junior led the Aggies with 11 touchdowns that included scores as a running back, receiver, and kick returner. A. Chain playing off the bench for the most part, still tallied up over 900 yards rushing with nine touchdowns, averaging seven yards per carry, which led the SEC. And the versatile back led the team with 1,472 all-purpose yards. Russell Westbrook get him a lot. Bricks. Oh, no, no, oh. no, 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 put, no, no, no. put down it. No, uh, scoring triple-double. Yeah. <laughs> the Spurs' number one draft pick, Jeremy Sohan, getting a little pushback on social media after his response to a word association game. He was playing with fellow first-round draft pick Malachi Branham at the Summer League Games in Las Vegas. So, by the way, Sohan addressed his response on social media with this. It's banter. I was not intending on being disrespectful. Heat of the moment. I was playing a game, baby. In Sohan's defense, Westbrook did struggle in his first season with the Lakers, so he was looking for the answer. Russell Westbrook triple-double. Instead, he said brick, which, quite frankly, well, was kind of close to it last season. And, and quite <laughs> frankly, if you and I or Stephanie say that, we're fine. We don't oh, have no. to face him on the court. Right, you'll never see so him. So, and may, may have to. Now, see what happens if Westbrook grinds up in silver and black someday. Oh, <laughs> Greg. Don't speak it into existence, please. <laughs> we'll be right back after this. Right, here's, here's a look at area reservoir levels. Medina Lake, 12% full, 67 feet below conservation pool. Canyon Lake, 91% full and 4 feet low. We need rain. Yes, we do. GMSA at 6.30 in the morning. Thanks for joining us. Excuse me, 4.30 in the morning. I'm going to say in 6.30 in the morning. It's not Friday. <laughs> I know.